You know, this has to be one of my least favorite days of the year. And it's nothing more than simply interrupts my normal patterns, amen? That's all it is. Whoever had this idea, I don't know. I think they ought to just, like Arizona doesn't have daylight savings time. So uh, maybe we ought to be like Arizona. Amen. Last week, I talked, and for the past couple of weeks, I've been talking about the life of Peter. And last week, I talked about how Peter was sitting with Jesus around a fire, and he just made a decision to leave the fish and to run to Jesus. Actually, he swam to Jesus, but it sounds kind of better to say he ran to Jesus. Um, and Jesus exhorted Peter. He said, feed my sheep. Feed my sheep. Tend my sheep. Mentor the ones that God has surrounded you or will surround you with. Mentor them in the ways of Jesus. Care for them. Protect them. Become a father or a mother to those that are coming after you. And I had a, a brother come up afterwards, and he said, you know, the thing that God was really showing me or, or burdening me with was not only do we need to understand the responsibility of fathers and the call to, to lead others, but we also have a call and responsibility as sons and as daughters. And so I want to talk about that this morning. The, the, the title for the message this morning is The Responsibility of Sons. When I say sons, I'm saying this is not gender exclusive. How many of you women know that you can be considered a son in the things of God? So don't take offense at that. I may say sons and daughters. I may say sons. But it means all of us. Of course, how many of you guys know that you're also considered a bride? So that's the other side of this. We're part of the bride of Christ. So, you know, we're understanding this different aspects of God and different aspects of who we are as followers of him. When I talk about sons, I'm talking about our relationship with our Heavenly Father. But I'm also talking about our relationship with our earthly fathers. And I say plural specifically because we not only had a natural father, but Many of us, I believe, are intended to have spiritual fathers, spiritual mothers that go ahead of us in the faith. And the way that we relate to these in many ways determines the level of how far we go in the things of God. See, we live in a culture that likes this individuality that says it's just between me and God. But the problem is that the way God set this whole thing up was... The Bible is very specific. And in the last days, he says, I will turn the hearts of the fathers to the sons and the hearts of the sons to the fathers. There's a generational dynamic that must, many of us in the Western church in particular are missing totally. And so what happens is we come to Jesus and everything's wonderful and we're excited about it. But many of us begin to flame out. And then we wonder, okay, what, what was that? And the reality is that God created us to be in relationship with one another. And he created this not just to be an individualistic gospel where I pray a prayer and go to heaven, but to be a gospel in the context of community where we are interacting with spiritual moms and dads, spiritual sons and daughters. And as a result, we improve and we move into all that God has for us to move into because we're not alone, but we do it together. And we do it in relationship. One of the things that I was privileged to do in my 20s was I began to understand and learn what it meant to be a son. Because my father had a business. He started this business in the late 70s, and it was just him. And then he, he went to, and he, he, uh, he got a loan from the bank, and he built this grain elevator. And he got busy very quickly. And I went to work for him. Now, I knew that I was called to ministry, but, you know, sometimes when you're called to ministry, 
The best training ground is in the marketplace. Do you know that? And some of us, I think, resist getting jobs or we resist being involved in daily kind of activities. Well, I'm called to ministry. Well, good. You're called to ministry. Now go work and minister as you go. But one of the things that I realized and have come to really value is those years that I spent working, living as a son in a family business. Because a son in a family business is not the owner. That's dad. So the final shots, the one who has final authority is not the son. But the son also has responsibilities and privileges that an employee doesn't have. Employees would come to work at 7 o'clock in the morning. They get done about 4, 4.30. They go home. They could go home, they could relax, they didn't have to worry about that. The son, if there's things that need to be done, there were many, many, many days that I would be there at 5.30 in the morning getting things ready for when the employees got there. Did dad get there at that time? No. I had the keys to the place. I opened up, made product, did whatever it took. And many, many days at 4.30 when the employees went home, they were ready to get off. But guess who didn't get off until the work was done? It wasn't a matter of hours. It was a matter of, is everything finished for the day? And so I would work till 5.30, 6 o'clock, sometimes on into the evening to get things done. That was part of the responsibilities of being a son. But there were also privileges because, you know, if everything was good and things were right, and everybody was doing what they're supposed to be doing, I could go to my father and say, Dad, I need, to, I need to go this afternoon. Would you mind if I went for a couple of hours and did this? And it could be something totally, like, fun. If everything was right, he'd say, well, yeah, sure, go. At the end of the year, there was bonuses. And the employees got bonuses, but you know what? The son got a little better bonus. Because you see, when you work in a family business, ultimately as a son, I'm not only working for dad, I'm working for myself because there is an inheritance that happens when the father passes that on to the son. The father doesn't generally pass a business on to his employees. I mean, he could set it up that way. But generally, a business gets passed to the sons, the daughters, the children. And what you've worked for years to develop now becomes yours. Actually, that's a very biblical concept. I looked at Jesus' example. What are the responsibilities that he had as a son? And I'm going to share three with you. These are not exclusive. The first one is be about your father's business. That basically defined what Jesus was about. It says in Luke 2, 49 and 52, And Jesus said to them, Why do you seek me? Did you not know that I must be about my father's business? But they did not understand the statement which he spoke to them. And then he went down with them, and he came to Nazareth and was subject to them. But his mother kept all these things in her heart, and Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and with men. Jesus needed to be about his father's business. In this case, it was his heavenly father. Jesus, they had come to the, the festival and, you know, family entourage kind of thing. And so there were aunts and uncles, and this was a high time in, in the, the year schedule of, of, of Israel. And they came, and they celebrated this, and then they decided they were going to go home. And a couple of days into the journey, mom and dad realized that Jesus wasn't with the cousins. And so they looked, and they looked, and finally they went back for him. And they found him in the temple teaching and interacting with the religious leaders of the day. And the Bible says that they were amazed. Jesus was anointed when he did this. The other thing is he was 12 years old. He was 12 years old. And Jesus says to his parents, why did you seek me? Did you not know that I must be about my father's business? I don't know that many 12-year-olds have business. I mean, here's Jesus. He's just 
given his parents a heart attack. I mean, how many of you have you had a 12-year-old son or daughter and you left them in Walmart? Would just leave them there like three days? I mean, you, you don't do that. You don't just, you know, you don't just, and if you do, you go back real quick. Well, it took them three days. Nancy and I went over to SeaWorld. It's been years ago. Daniel was like three. And we went over there, and over in SeaWorld, they have this children's play area. It's kind of like this, one of these great big things that I wish they had when I was a kid, because I'd have loved it, you know. It's one of those things that when I'm 50, I look at and say, man, they invented this 25 years too late. And the boys were running in, in through this thing, and it was one of those things where you crawl in through the tunnels and up and down and all this kind of stuff. It had like five levels, and, you know, and it was, it was, it was big. I mean, you know, big. And we watching the boys, and Joshua came out, and Daniel didn't come out. And so we watched again, you know, and Joshua went up and climbed all through it and came out, and Daniel didn't come out. And Mrs. Slay got a little bit agitated. She's like, where's my son? And so we sent Joshua in to go look, see if you can find Daniel. And Dan, Joshua goes in and goes all through the thing, comes out. I don't know where he is. And Mama Slay was ready to shut down the whole park. Where's my kid? Where's my son? I don't know. And, and, and you know, and the, you know, so finally I get in there, you know, can't go do something. That's, that's the solution to the problem. And so, you know, I, I start trying to crawl through these little, you know, things. And, and I'm not the smallest of guys. And um, but Joshua finally finds him. He's just crawled off. In one of these little, you know, there was like these little little tube that went and didn't have any, it was a dead end. And he's just sitting there. He's happy. He's not lost. He knows exactly where he is. He's right there. But there's something happens when you think you've lost your child. And this is what Mary and Joseph were going through. And then he, they come back, and Jesus says, i got to be about my father's business. You know, when you're 12, you think you know a little more than you really know. It really happens when you're about 16. But, um, but the Bible says that Jesus, he went down with them, and he subjected he was subject to them. In other words, he came and he submitted himself to his earthly parents. He submitted himself to his earthly parents. And in essence, what he did was he became about his father's business. And his father's business, Joseph's business, was a carpenter. And he became a carpenter. And he worked in the family business until he was 30 years old. And the Bible says that he increased in wisdom. That's a good thing. From 12 to 30, you increase in a lot of things. But you know, you have experiences that will deepen your wisdom about life. It's not just about spiritual things. It's about interacting with people. It's about interacting with a trade. It's about understanding and, and knowing who you are as an individual. Your identity it says he increased in age, obviously, and in physical development, also obviously, in stature. But it says that he increased in favor. Favor rested upon his life because he subjected himself, or he was subject to, his earthly parents. And he increased in favor with God. God honors that kind of submission. When you and I understand the alignment that God purposes for our lives, when we find ourselves in relationship, right relationship with our earthly parents, but also with spiritual fathers, spiritual mothers, the favor of God begins to rest upon us because we have positioned ourselves to be able to receive all that God has for us. See, many of us, even in this room, have not had spiritual moms and dads. We don't have a grid to put this in. Because we may have had parents, but they were not good parents. And I say that, I don't say that to, to down anybody. But, you know, for, for some of us, we grew up in a terrible home. 
The last thing we wanted was a relationship with dad, a relationship with mom, and that causes us to mistrust any other authority in our life. And so we are effectively an island on our own, doing it our own way, making it as best we can. We do two steps forward. We fail and take one step back. We try to, try to figure it out for ourselves. God never intended it for it to be that way. He intended that we learn from the experiences that have the, from those that have gone before us. If I, as a father, am a good father, hopefully my sons won't have to do the stupid things I did. Won't have to get involved in the same kind of things that lost me money. Won't have to do the things that really caused relational relations not to work. If I'm wise, I can impart that to sons. Jesus was about his earthly father's business as well. And he increased with God, in favor with God, but he also increased in favor with men. You see, he began to understand. He began to see that as he embraced the, the, the place where God had him, he was in a carpenter's home. But he increased in the favor with men. See, a son has to endure, if you will, a time of apprenticeship. Because the son doesn't know enough yet to do the things that his father is doing. Now, he may think he does, but the reality is he doesn't. I can remember things that when Nancy and I were in our mid-20s, we were under Pastor Gerald's ministry, and we would have conversations. Why is he doing that? That doesn't make any sense. I would do it this way. Have you ever had that kind of conversation? Maybe not out loud, but at least in your mind. If I was the pastor, I'd do it this way. Well, I had those every week. And now that I'm in the position that he was in, I look back and I think, man, was I dumb. That was just totally stupid. But now I have a different perspective. You know, it would be wise of me if I had learned and had the foresight to, to say, Pastor Joe, why are you doing that? Why is this? You know, what, what are you gaining from that? Or, or why have you done that? But, you know, we tend to just simply go our own way because we don't know anything different. Jesus increased in favor with men. He had to develop that favor. And favor, I believe in this context, is contacts, it's relationships, it's, it's the business kind of reputation that anybody needs to be successful. And he had his father, who was a reputable businessman, standing behind him, standing with him, teaching him the trade, so that when Jesus went and made a business deal, dad would stand behind him. I had that experience because my dad bought and sold commodities. And what he said went. But there would be times that I would be out with a, with, with a, with a, a customer and he would want to buy shell corn. And this could be, a, a, I mean, a, this had the potential to be a really large transaction. But, you know, if I quoted him a price, that's what we did. And there was one or two times that dad said, you, you quoted him that price? Like as in, that's really low. But because I was the son, he stood behind me. And we honored that. See, really, when the son is about his father's business, he's investing in himself. And when he invests in himself... He invests in his future. A son, if we allow ourselves that sonship and daughtership, that's not a word, but if we allow ourselves to rest in those kind of relationships. I was reading a book called Outliers by a guy named Malcolm Gladwell. Not necessarily a spiritual book, but there's spiritual principles there. One thing that he mentioned got my attention. He said it takes about 10,000 hours to be an expert. An expert, like a, a you know, that, that people recognize. 10,000 hours. Somebody like Bill Gates, he got 10,000 hours programming computers while he was still like a teenager. And the, just the way that things set up, 
certain things worked out that he had computer time when nobody else did and he and he, he loved it it's what he wanted to do he'd go in weekends nights all that kind of stuff by the time he had 10,000 hours he was ready to launch Microsoft the Beatles got about 10,000 hours playing music together they started out as a garage band they started out okay, but then they got this, this somebody, it was, it was one of those random things to play, not in, in London, but in Hamburg, Germany, and so they would go over there for periods of time. In London, they might play a gig, and it might be an hour. In Germany, they were expected to play like eight hours, nonstop, seven days a week. Now think about that for a little bit. How does that change your mentality? If I'm a musician and I play for an hour, you know, I think that's pretty good. My fingers are a little sore because I play guitar. And, you know, I'm ready to go take, get a coffee. Wimpy, wimpy, wimpy. I mean, these guys were playing, and they played for like eight-hour sets. Now, they couldn't just turn around and play the same songs. So they had to also practice, develop new music. They ended up delving into some different kinds of, of, of genres of music, into jazz a little bit, into you know, those kinds of things, so that they came out of that two-year period. They were good going in, but they were great coming out because they had developed their sound, developed their skill, and now they were ready for a world stage. Am I making sense this morning? Now, see, when you take that time as a son, when you take that time as a daughter, and you invest in your parents, you are about what your father's business is. You learn the business, and you learn it well. And then, in due time, you're ready. Jesus, when he was 30, that's when his public ministry started. When I was 18, I thought that was an eternity. I thought a 30-year-old was an old man. I thought 50 was ancient. And now that I'm 50, I think that ain't too bad. Jesus, I mean, I think God takes a longer view of us. He takes a longer view. The second thing about our responsibilities as son, only do what you've seen your father do. John 5, 19 and 20, Jesus answered, speaking to the Pharisees, there he said to them, Most assuredly I say to you, the son can do nothing of himself, but what he sees the father do. For whatever he does, the son also does in like manner. For the father loves the son and shows him all things that he himself does. Fathers know things. Fathers have a way of knowing things. Nancy's dad can fix anything with duct tape and maybe something else. A piece of wire, paper clip. I mean, I, I, when I got married to her, I mean, it was amazing. He could. He, he just, well, let's just do this, you know, and it, zip, zip, and, and it works. Fathers know how to do things. And fathers know things, mothers know things that sons and daughters need to learn. Fathers and mothers have been through relational kinds of things in their marriage that if the son or the daughter will even observe, even ask questions about, can help the son or daughter avoid similar mistakes. They know things, they know skills, they know how to do things. And, and, you know, it may not be obvious, but, you know, you know how, if you're a dad or a mom in here, you know, you have, you have knowledge, information, even in the natural, that your sons and your daughters can benefit from if you will share it with them. But sons and daughters, you have to be open to learning it. And you may say, you know, you may be 18, 19, I don't want to help dad on that project. That's, I'd rather do my own thing. And then 10 years later, you have the same project. And you realize, you know what, I really wish I'd have paid attention. 
would have really been good. It's lessons learned from experience. My dad told me don't loan money to anybody if you're not willing to give it to them. Sometimes they pay you back, sometimes they don't. You know, that's pretty good. It's just things that dads know, that moms know. That if the sons or the daughters are open, spiritually it's the same thing. There are things that your spiritual fathers, your spiritual mothers know because they've experienced it, they've walked it out by trial and error, they've had to figure it out. That if we are wise, we will learn from them. That's where we learn obedience. That's where we learn submission. We don't like those kind of words. And yet, I guarantee you, unless you understand and learn submission and obedience, you will probably last in a job about two and a half months. Because your employer or your boss will tell you to do something, and you don't want to do it, and you get in attitude, and you say, forget these people over here. I'm going to go and work for this person over here. And so you go, and maybe you get a job over here. And two and a half months later, they tell you to do something that you don't want to do. And you get irritated and offended at them. So you go somewhere else. And all of a sudden, you've been through six jobs in a year and a half. And you wonder why you aren't getting ahead. It's because you haven't learned the lessons that you need to learn to be an employee. Where do you get those things? You get them from your family. And if we don't have a family, it's very difficult to learn some of those basic lessons. I didn't like it when my dad told me to do things. But I did them. When you're a son, you do the, that kind of stuff. In the family business, the employees got to do things. They, they got a certain set job. They had to go and they made feet. Or they went and they drove truck. Or they went and they did this or that. The son gets to do whatever the, the, nobody else wants to do. So in our situation, many times that was hard work because we had these pits that we, we, they, the trucks would come and dump grain in and underneath the pit was just open and, and, and it would get wet if it would rain and the drainage wasn't what it's supposed to be and the water would fill up and, and it would be a bunch of junk in there that would get in there. Guess who got to go down underneath those things? I'd come home some nights and Nancy wouldn't let me in the house. I smelled so bad. We had these great big grain bins, great big, and they had flat bottoms. And the flat bottom bins, we had these little augers that we set in there, and it would sweep the, the, the grain bins, but it wouldn't get it all. Guess who got to shovel out the bottoms of the bins? Hallelujah. Learn to work. Employees didn't necessarily have to do that son did I remember one time I'd been shoveling out bins like that and I was all white with corn dust and stuff and I left work I didn't clean up I just wanted to get home I stopped at 7-eleven for a coke I walked up to pay for it and the lady looked at me like are you okay <laughs> you look <laughs> you're pale so I just kind of went like this and said I'm all right you know you see Fathers have the responsibility to show sons what they need to know, to show sons what to do. But the father provides a foundation for the sons and the daughters to build upon. The son embraces the identity of the father. Jesus, we call him a carpenter. Why? Because his father was. And it's not just about a last name. It's about characteristics of the family. And because the son has an identity, the daughter has an identity, they have the confidence to proceed in life. Because it's more than just them. They have people that are behind them, that are for them, that are encouraging them. And some things the father specifically teaches. Some things you verbalize, but other things you simply model. And they're picked up because it's just the way we do things. In ministry, the father's message is where the son starts. 
Paul spoke this to Timothy, 2 Timothy 2.2. 2. The things you have heard from me among many witnesses, commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others. The things you have heard from me. If you didn't hear it from me, question it. But if you heard it from me, it's solid, it's good, you can count on it. Because I'm not going to lead you astray. I'm not going to give you anything that is going to be detrimental to you or to your ministry or to the ministry as you minister to those that God entrusts you with. That's what Paul is saying here. And the son has the responsibility to pay attention to the father's actions and the father's words. To do what he's seen the father do, but understand there's a lot of other things out there. It's not that those things are wrong. It's just simply here's the starting point. This is the foundation. And as you move from that, stay connected to your foundation. The third responsibility of sons and daughters, bestow honor on your father and mother. In Matthew 15, we see Jesus using this as an example. Jesus is speaking here. The Pharisees ask him, why do your disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? And Jesus answered them and says, well, why do you transgress the commandment of God? Because of your traditions. It says, for God commanded, saying, honor your father and mother, and he who curses father and mother, let him be put to death. But you say, whoever says to his father or mother, whatever profits you might have received from me as a gift to God then he need not honor his father and mother. Thus you have made the commandment of God of no effect in your tradition. Hypocrites. Well did Isaiah prophesy about you, saying, These people draw near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And in vain they worship me, teaching us decrees, teaching us doctrines, the commandments of men. Now here, Jesus is making a point, but his example is one I want to look at. The commandment was to honor father and mother. The Pharisees had perverted this commandment. They thought they knew better. Sound familiar? I know this is what dad says, but I really want to do it my way. I know this is what my mom says. I know this is what my spiritual authorities say. But you know, I think I know better because I'm 12. And they took money that was meant for their parents and gave it to the synagogue. And because they were teachers of the law, effectively what they were doing is keeping it for themselves. And in effect, God said they made the commandment of God of no effect. So in essence, they were dishonoring both their natural parents and they were dishonoring God by what they were doing. In the Jewish tradition, the way that this worked is at about 30 years of age, the son would take over the father's business. So the father would be about 50, 55. The son would have grown enough, worked enough in the family business or whatever it was, was that the family did, that at about 30 years of age, they would make this transfer and the son, in essence, became the father. And the father continued to take a salary. He was supported, but he was released from many of the daily activities. So he could go on to do things like be an elder. You know, elder type things. Sit at the city gates and talk to the other guys and have coffee you know, solve the city's problems. The sons are out there doing their business, but the fathers are honored. And what they did here was the ones that were doing the work, they decided, you know what? I don't like this system anymore. Dad's not pulling his weight anymore. I'm just going to give everything to the synagogue. I'm going to bring it into the temple instead of honoring the commandment to father and mother. And the Pharisees, they broke the system. But he says something interesting. He says, well, Isaiah prophesied, these people draw near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from God. You see, what Jesus was saying is when you do this, not only are you dishonoring God and dishonoring your parents, but the way that you honor your fathers and mothers is an indicator of your honor for God. 
These things are important to God. He goes on to say, in vain they worship me. That's pretty harsh. To say that their worship is not acceptable based on how they honor those that have gone before them. Think about that for a little bit. We live in a Western culture. We basically say, I'm going to re be responsible for me and mine, and you be responsible for you. I'm going to be responsible for me. God's turning that on its head. He said, no, you have fathers, you have mothers you need to be accountable and responsible to. You're going to have children. There is a generational connection that needs to be solid. Turning the hearts of the fathers to the sons, the hearts of the sons to the fathers. This needs to happen lest I strike the earth with a curse. Bestow honor. Give credit to your fathers, your mothers. And cover your father's mistakes and shortcomings. How many of you have to say everything that you know? Good. That was a good one not to raise your hand on. Because let me tell you something. You don't want to know what a mark of maturity is when you don't have to tell everything you know about somebody? It's a mark of immaturity and insecurity when you have to take what somebody else did that maybe they don't look the best and puts them in the best light and you tell everybody about that. Stop it. You don't have to tell everything that you know. The best thing that you can do for spiritual moms and dads, for your own natural parents, is cover them. Remember the story of Noah? Not the ark. There's other stories about Noah. After the ark, he came out. I mean, this takes time, obviously, but he planted a vineyard. When he planted a vineyard, he produced grapes. When he got his grapes, he made wine. When he made wine, he got drunk, the Bible says, and ended up in his tent naked. His youngest son found him. His youngest son went and told everybody else. At that point, it was just his brothers. His brothers went in. And instead of looking at him, took a cloth, took a, a blanket-like thing, and held it on the shoulders and backed up and did not look, the Bible says, on his nakedness. Covered him up. Noah blessed his two older sons. But the younger one you don't hear anything more about. Because he uncovered his father. You know... We talk about being family here, but you're going to know things in your family relationships. If you're in a small group with somebody and somebody confesses something to you, if you know something about those, you know, you, you, we talk about maintaining confidence. A mark of maturity is for you to be able to maintain confidence and not speak those things. I know things about you all that I don't even share with Nancy. She knows things that... She didn't share with me. Why? I don't need to know. But you see, you may begin to know things about each other. You begin to know things about your spiritual fathers and mothers, your, your natural fathers and mothers that nobody else needs to know. A mark of maturity is to be able to keep that confidence. You don't have to talk about it. It's a matter of honor. It's a matter of honor. It's not covering up sin. If, it, if there's sinful things, okay, there may be, you need to deal with it. Most of the time, it's just simply things that are shortcomings in a person's life. But see, we have a problem. We hear messages like this, and we have a problem, and the basic problem is trust. Too often, our fathers and our mothers have not necessarily been trustworthy. We've been in relationship with them. They haven't necessarily looked out after our own best interest, but they've looked out after their own best interest. And what it does is it makes us very, very suspicious. It makes us suspicious of the spiritual moms and dads that we may have been given. It makes us suspicious of authority. It makes us suspicious because we think because we have had that experience as a child that nobody is really looking out for me. Nobody really has my best interest. So if I'm going to make it in this world, I've got to look out for myself. I've got to do things the way that I can do them, the best that I can. 
And too often, fathers in particular have abused their authority and they've abandoned their authority. They haven't given their sons, their daughters, the things that they need to really succeed in life. And so as sons, many times we've had to figure things out for ourselves. I want to issue a challenge to you because if you're in that guy, you may have had parents. It's, this is not downing on parents, but it's simply to say some of us may find ourselves, feel about ourselves. You know, what do I do? How can I really be a spiritual mom and dad if I haven't experienced it myself? Some of us are called to be pioneers, to do things that we haven't seen modeled. To do things out of conviction and out of principle. To simply step out and become what we wish we had had. I'm sorry you didn't have a good upbringing, but you know what? You can't go back. I'm sorry you were hurt. I'm sorry you were wounded. I really am. But the reality is you are where you are, and you can only start from today forward. You can only start. If you're in that age where you say, you know, I know I probably missed it. I know I can't go back. I wish I could go back and have a good relationship with my dad. I wish I could go back and have a good relationship with my mom. But you didn't get that. Okay. You're going to have to adapt, and it's going to be harder. But the reality is that you can be, for another younger man, another younger woman, what you wish had been done for you. See, as though, even though our parents haven't necessarily got it right all the time, we still, as sons and daughters, have the responsibility to honor, to do what we've seen them do, to learn from them. And so as a son or as a daughter, we have to make a decision to trust again. To trust again. This can be hard. But how else, unless we make a decision to open ourselves up to a relationship, can the hearts of the sons be turned to the fathers? You see, I'm both. I'm a father in the natural. I'm a father spiritually. But I'm also a son. How can I do that? How can I understand both? How can I work at that? Lord, help us to do that. We have to decide to trust the process again. We have to decide to trust. You know, one of the questions that gets asked is, well, why do we need the body? Why do we need church? Why do we need these, this group of people? It's because we need each other. It's because we desperately need each other. Some of you are here. You've had more experience in ministry than I have. I need your wisdom. But some of you are just coming up. You, you don't know what you don't know yet. And you need to be open to what God wants to teach you through the people in this body. To move ahead. Amen? Let's stand together. I want the worship team to come. You know, I talk about these things. There's some people here. You need to stop making excuses. You need to stop making excuses for the decision that you've made. And you've said, well, if I had a better dad, or yeah, if my mom was more involved, or yeah, if I had more opportunity, or yeah, if I had the breaks that somebody else had, yeah, then I could be okay. Then I wouldn't be, and you have this sense that you're just, just deformed, or, or you're just not like everybody else. The reality is all those things are simply excuses. You've been given a wonderful life. You've been given things talents, giftings that God is calling forth out of you, but you've let these excuses hinder you from moving ahead. 
And this morning, I want to challenge you. I want to challenge you to come to God and repent of those excuses. And simply make the decision as for me and my house, we are going to serve the Lord. I may have to pioneer some things. I may have to do some things that I, 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 I've never done before. But I'm going to make a commitment to do so. I invite you to come to the altar this morning. If you know that you have dishonored the relationship with your parents, if you know you've dishonored that relationship in the natural, with your natural parents, or if you know that you've dishonored that relationship with your spiritual moms and dads or those that have gone ahead of you, I am asking you to repent as well, to ask the Lord for forgiveness, for dishonoring those that he put in your life to teach you and to train you and to love you and to encourage you. And yeah, maybe they didn't do that or didn't do that perfectly. But again, that's no excuse. Father, I thank you. And I bless you tonight. I pray that you would open our hearts to receive your word and let it begin to grow even now. Father, bring conviction into our lives in the areas that you want us to respond to you and give us the confidence and the courage to respond. Father, I thank you. I bless you. I acknowledge you. In Jesus' name, amen.